I am taking a very different approach to this um, to this course, um, which might might surprise you, and that is this is the outline of the courses, uh, the classes in this course. Uh, today, I'm going to do an introduction to rhetoric. And if you don't know what rhetoric is, you may you may have the the common understanding of rhetoric or rhetoric or rhetorical, which is usually something that's flippant and not serious and you know uh, not to be taken uh, to be taken lightly. That's not at all what it is. I'll explain that. And then over the next five weeks, I will be unfolding, and this is the approach I'm taking to communication with homiletics, the five canons or rules of rhetoric and how they apply to communications and homiletics. And by the way, if you don't know homiletics, I'll give you that definition later, but homiletics is the process of creating and delivering sermons or lessons. It can be, a, you know, uh, homiletics can be the process of teaching uh, as well as preaching. I'm approaching this from the point of view of classical rhetoric. I'll define that later. There are five rules of classical rhetoric. There is what, what they call invention, inventio in Latin, which is finding the meaning, arrangement, which is organizing the materials for communication, style, answering the real questions in terms of how you how best to communicate, memory, which is preparing to present, doesn't necessarily mean memorizing, although it can. And we'll talk, as we get into this, we'll talk about how we solve the practical problems if you want to preach or teach. Um, like, how do you remember this stuff? And then delivery, the actual presentation. These are the five rules or canons of rhetoric in the classical sense. Um, as first really developed by Aristotle, so this goes back a ways, and then developed amongst the great Latin orators of Rome. Then um, the seventh week, we will talk about the act of preaching and teaching, which is not the same thing, I don't believe. Some people, it's very common for people today to confuse that. People who say they're preachers, I believe, are really teachers. And we'll talk about the difference. I'll give you an example of the difference. One of the great sermons, one of the great preaching acts of the 20th century was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech. You know, um, I have a dream where my children will be uh, <clears throat> judged not by the color of the skin, but by the content of the character. That was a great sermon, a preaching act. There was no factual content communicated in that sermon. There were no numbers, no dates, no facts, no nothing that would be mentally acquired. But it touched your heart. You know, it, it changed people's lives. To me, preaching, it may have factual content. That doesn't mean it can't have, but preaching is the act of communicating to people in a heartfelt way to change lives. Teaching, also critically important, is the communication of information that people take into their mind <clears throat> so that they grow mentally, intellectually from their understanding of things. Is that fair? So we'll talk about that. Doesn't mean that a sermon doesn't have, have some informational content. It doesn't mean that that teaching can't also touch people's hearts and change their lives. But there still is a, a fundamental difference, I believe, in those two things, as someone who both preaches and teaches. Um, and then we'll talk about applying the principles in the final exam in the eighth week. And let me say something right up front. It is not possible for me to teach a class like this without from time to time making it sound like I know exactly how to do this, which means I'm perfect at this, and that's not at all the case. Uh, I believe that among the, the gifts that God gives all of us, and everybody has gifts, that I have a gift of teaching and preaching. It doesn't mean I'm the best teacher or the best preacher around, and I always can get better, and I will get better as I go through this process with you. But some of it, like at the end of today, I'm going to give you tips for doing better, in communicating, preaching, teaching, whatever, and there are tips from Ross. These are things I believe, things I have learned, and so it's from me to you. Um, but please don't ever think as we go through this that I'm suggesting that I've got it all wired, that I'm perfect at this. Um, I've been doing it a long time, and I think, by God's grace, I've gotten fairly good at it, so I will share what I know and what other people have. Is that fair? Good. Okay, and if I ever, if you ever feel like I've stepped over that line, then, you know, take me aside, smack me upside the head as we go along, okay? <laughs> <coughs> Any questions about where we're going with this? Today will be a general introduction. Always, if I'm doing an introduction to whatever the class is, I'm kind of hitting the high points, many of which we will unfold and develop in more detail later. So I want to start out by, saying, by talking about a return to classical education. Um, in classical education, which continued really up until the 19th century, um, was made up of what they call the seven classical liberal arts. 
That's where we get the expression liberal arts. Um, the first three of these were called the trivium, which means three, actually three ways. You know, tri via in Latin, the three, the, or the three roads, rather. Um, those three were and are logic. Logic can be understand, understood as the mechanics of thought and analysis. Some of you have been in classes or in sermons where I've talked about uh, the three rules of thought, the three you know, most critical laws of logic. The law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the excluded middle. Logic was taught, and by that we don't just mean just making good sense. It's a formal study of how you can think reasonably, rationally, and analyze things reasonably. The Earth. What determines a year? The revolution of the Earth around the Sun. Well, from years and days, we get minutes, and we get seconds, and we get degrees. All of those numbers that we base everything on are uh, basically astronomy. And yet, we don't think about this stuff this way anymore. Now, for all, I wanted to give you this whole thing. And our word trivial, by the way, comes from the word trivium. And the reason is because compared to astronomy, music, geometry, and arithmetic, logic, grammar, and rhetoric were thought of as being easy. And by comparison, easy became trivial. It doesn't mean they're not important, it just means by comparison, they were the easier of the three arts. More straightforward. Uh, they're, they're sort of a finite into them. You can complete your study of logic or grammar, and to some extent rhetoric, whereas music and astronomy, for instance, go on forever. You know. Uh, okay. I wanted to give that to you so that you get some idea where I'm coming from and using rhetoric as the, found, as the outline, the basis for us pursuing this. So, rhetoric is the use of language, which I would define as the knowledge of grammar, the mechanics of language, plus logic, the reasoning that we use to make good structure of language, to instruct and persuade a listener or reader. Okay? Now, um, let me stop there and ask you a question. Do you have a problem with that word persuade there? Uh, and, and let me make a statement and ask you to argue with me. I believe that all interpersonal communication, that means all communication between two people or between one person and multiple people, any, any communication between people is at its root an attempt to persuade. Any reaction to that? <coughs> what do you think? Any interpersonal communication is at its root an attempt to persuade. That's a thesis I wrote in my communication because of my undergraduate degrees in communication theory. Margaret? Well, we all have an infinite number of choices. Which one should we choose? So one says to another, let's go here, or let's do that. Right. You know, uh, otherwise, if you just talk and say nothing, <laughs> basically, right. it's just noise. Yep. And even maybe perhaps at, a, at a, a more foundational level than that, if I say something to you, either individually or as a group, I'm saying, you should listen to me. You should accept this as true. No matter what it is I'm saying, whether I'm telling you, you know, introducing you to the classic uh, seven liberal arts, or whether I'm saying, that coffee at that place next door is really awful. Or, you know, that new Mazda I bought is just a great car. Everything we say, even if it's just at the, at the level of saying, listen to me and you know, pay attention to what I have to say, that's, that's persuading. I'm trying to persuade you to pay attention. Or if it's the content. Now, that to me is a very important point. Rhetoric historically is understood as the effort to instruct and persuade, or, and persuade people. Some people have a problem with that. In fact, some, uh, some Christians especially have a problem with the idea of rhetoric. Um, and there's a reason. Historically, rhetoric was, it was invented by the sophists. And we think the word, the very word sophist is, um, we think means somebody who's not sincere, who can't be trusted, you know, he uses words to, to twist things. Um, it, it has a negative connotation. It was actually a, a philosophical movement in ancient Greece that invented rhetoric, but they were known for using rhetoric, and they mastered the use of language to convince people of things. But the things they tried to convince, they had very strong political ideas. And so they advocated for certain political views. They also tended to be fairly immoral. And so they used their ability to argue or persuade to both question the traditional religious views in ancient Greece, and also to try to justify getting away with doing all the things they wanted to do. 
And one of the principles the sophists had was that it didn't matter whether your argument was true or not if you, if you could make it work. That truth or, or falsehood in an argument was not an issue, it's just are you good enough at it to pull it off? That was their whole focus. That's why self, uh, sophistry, as it's called, has gotten a negative name. It actually was a school of philosophy. They also, they, when I say they, they advocated for some immorality and against religion, they're the ones that first said, man is the measure of all things. In other words, if you're smart enough to get away with it, then, you know, you're okay. So a lot of people think of rhetoric as being just associated with a sophist, but it actually was a fundamental part of both Greek and Roman culture. Today, when we try somebody in a court of law, how do we do it? By talking. And how do we talk? I mean, what, what, what's the process that goes on? The prosecutor gets up and says, this is what happened. Um, this is, you know, this person is guilty for these reasons, and I'm going to present all the evidence to prove that is true, and so that you will convict this guy and send him to the chair or whatever. And then the defense attorney gets up and says, this is not true. The prosecution has no grounds for this. There is no solid evidence. I will prove to you that the evidence that's to be presented is not valid, etc., etc. Our whole legal system is based on rhetoric and effort to persuade. We determine, you know, uh, whether somebody's guilty of a crime or not using rhetoric. We determine virtually everything of any significance. Business deals. You know, when we sit down and negotiate a deal, negotiating is trying to use, basically, rhetoric to convince the other person that it is in both, both persons' advantage to do it the way I want to do it, not the way you want to do it. Almost everything that we do involves rhetorical efforts to communicate, instruct, and persuade. Now, some Christians have a problem, either because with rhetoric as a theme, either because they associate it back to sophistry and the sophists and all that, or else because they, they feel that speaking of, of being systematic and disciplined about trying to persuade people is somehow wrong or inappropriate as though it implies manipulation. But you know what? Every time I get in a pulpit and preach a sermon, I'm trying to, to persuade people about the faith. What is evangelism if it's not trying to persuade people about the truth of the Christian faith? And so I don't have a problem at all with it. In fact, I think we've lost a lot by losing our background in understanding the principles and canons and process of rhetoric as the use of language to instruct and effectively persuade listeners or readers. Okay? So that's where I'm coming from. And I think it's a good structure for us to work under. Lynn? Is there a fine line between instruction and persuasion? Because I was doing some diabetes education and I thought I was presenting facts. <coughs> straightforward facts. This is reality. And I was speaking to the wife, and the husband is there, and he says, boy, is she ever persuasive. And I'm thinking, I said to him, no, I'm just telling you the way it is. Yeah. Well, see, I don't think there's a difference. Because the very fact that you were telling them something, and you wanted them to listen to you, you wanted them to believe you, you wanted them to take these as facts, that, that's persuading. That's, you know, you're making an effort to persuade them of all those things, that you should be listened to, that you're making good sense, that these facts are true, and that they should accept them, all of those things. So any communication, I believe, is an effort to persuade, which is why I don't have a problem with that. Fair? And again, I believe that this classical approach is a very good outline on which we can hang in this communications and analytics process. And I'll be making those connections as we go on. But first, let me talk to you about the five canons or rules. The word canon means rule, literally, yardstick, a ruler. A canon in, in was the... The, a reed which was marked off that was used in construction. Um, and it literally means a ruler, a yardstick. So when we talk about the canon of Scripture, we mean the fact that, that Scripture is a, a yardstick, a measuring tool that we are supposed to apply to our lives. But when we use the word canon in the sense that I'm using it here, it means the rules. The five rules of rhetoric. These began with Aristotle, but they continued, and actually they were defined more in the sense I'm presenting these five in Latin oratory. As, as that developed. The first of these five canons <coughs> is invention or inventio in Latin. It means the evaluating your purpose and developing the argument or message. My way of expressing that, um, it, more practical, here's how we apply it, is 
You have to ask yourself, what do you want or need to say, and why do you need to say it? That's the in invention uh, part of this. Now, sometimes the premise of that is fairly obvious. I am the preacher of the Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Right now, I'm preaching a series of sermons on why we believe. Well, I've got like nine different points I need to make under why we believe. And so for me, the process of evaluating what I want or need to say, I had to say, um, and, and why I need to say it, these are, there are facts in support of belief in the Christian faith, and um, we often don't know those things, and we need to know them, and so I'm going to teach them. And then that's the invention part for me. If you have a group and you're asked to come and speak to that group, you have to ask yourselves questions like, who is this group? What are their needs? What should I be addressing with them? And, you know, what, what should my message be? I was asked not too long ago to speak at the Rotary Club, in, uh, that they were forming a new Rotary Club here. And they said, could you come and do the keynote address and something inspirational? Um, and I thought about, I read the purposes of Rotary. I used to be a Rotarian 100 years ago. That's a crazy story. Um, and in fact, they just voted me in here again. Um, and I read this and I thought about it and I, cre I did a, a message called uh, Achieving Greatness. And the point of it was that greatness, and this is consistent with the Rotary Club, but I'm encouraging this, greatness is not in being wealthy or famous, greatness is in service. We achieve greatness by serving. Okay, well, I, the invention process for me is who are these people, what do they need to hear, what's consistent with them, how might I address that? Okay, the same thing is true anytime. If you're, if you're asked to come and lead a devotional, you ask the same questions. If you're asked to do a, a teaching, Bible teaching or anything else, you ask the same questions. What do I need or want to say and why do I need to say it to this particular group? Now that second part is the part we often forget. People are always guilty of answering questions nobody's asked. All right? Why do I need to say this has to do with what do they need to hear. There's a famous New Yorker cartoon, I had it for years and years and then lost it. It's this guy in a long, long white robe and long white beard, and he's holding up a sign that says, God is the answer. Well, there's a businessman, you know, holding his briefcase, standing in front of him, and this old guy, God is the answer. And the businessman is looking at him, and the caption is, what's the question? Too often, we're so quick to jump about, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm going to say, Here, here's, here's the answer I'm going to give, when in fact the group you're talking to may not yet have asked that question, and that will affect your invention, how you decide what you're going to talk about. Fair? You guys know to ask questions as we go along if you have any questions about that, right? As you look at this book, and as, you, as we talk about this as we go along, you will see that reflected. You know, the first sections, it talks about um, diagramming the text structure, noting the text details, asking research questions, naming the text idea, Deciding what do I need to say and why do I need to say it? And if it's based upon a text, if you're starting with a text, then you draw out of that. What is there in this text that I need to say and why is this appropriate for this group? Okay. The second, well, that's different. Um, I'll put both of those up there because for some reason these, these lined up differently. Second is arrangement. Again, this is the classical or a dispositio as it is a disposition, dispositio in Latin. This is the, um, we, we translate this arrangement or organization. This is the decision um, of how I'm going to organize the argument or the message to provide the best effect. The question you would ask is, how do I structure and organize my message to best communicate with this audience? Um, am I going to give a case study? Am I going to... Um, have somebody offer a testimonial? Am I going to quote extensively from my favorite book on this topic? So organizing the argument, I've decided what my argument is and why I'm doing it under invention, and then I have to decide how I structure and organize that message to best communicate with this audience. And you'll notice I've got this italicized. And that differs. You know, what you're going, how you're going to uh, arrange or organize your argument if you're talking to your bridge club is different than if you're talking to you know, if Hugh is meeting with a group of prisoners uh, in his prison ministry, or if I'm talking to the people at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, I have to plan, organize um, my message appropriate to that. And I have to be conscious of those things. Okay? 
Whatever I've decided my message is under, under invention, I then have to decide how I'm going to arrange and organize it in order to present that. The third thing is style. This is determining how best to present the argument or message. What approach am I going to take? Am I going to be very formal um, and, and use very eloquent language? Am I going to, you know, do, do street talk? Um, am I going to, how am I going to communicate this? And many people who speak regularly, on, you know, preachers, for instance, they inevitably think that the more $2 words they can use, the better off they are. When I first moved to the Northwest, I was living on Bainbridge Island at first, and I went to, I was visiting churches, and I went to an Anglican church there. And this happened, just happened to be the, the anniversary of the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. And this... I have two master's degrees. I've got a pretty good vocabulary. And this um, Episcopal priest did a 20-minute homily, and in it he had half a dozen words that I do not know the meaning of. Do you think that was the right style to be preaching to a congregation? And the reason I say that is because just given how many years I've spent in school, if I didn't know the meaning of those words, I bet there were quite a few other people in that congregation who didn't know the meaning of those words. Is that the right style? for a Sunday morning congregation? No, if I'm, if I'm making a presentation to, um, you know, to the Quantum Mechanics Association of America, you know, these high-end physicists, does that change the style I'm using versus if I'm doing a presentation for a preschool group? Obviously. But we have to think about those things, and some people don't. Um, so, invention, arrangement, style, and then memory. Memory means learning and or memorizing the argument or message. In other words, how can I best be prepared to effectively deliver this message to the audience? Now, it used to be true um, that it was expected, it was thought of as being a real sign of weakness if you did any sort of oral presentation, rhetorical presentation, and used notes. The Greek speakers, and especially the Latin, you know, uh, when you get into Cicero, most people say Cicero, but in Latin it's Cicero, or Quintilian, or any of the famous orators, you know, they would have been laughed out of the, the hall if they had shown up with notes, because they were expected that this was, this was all done, and so they would memorize it. Um, and so there was an aspect in which the memorization was an important part of it. Um, even today, we give more veracity. A, if somebody were to stand up and to do closing arguments for a major trial, let's say the defense attorney gets up and he's carrying his notes around, is that going to have the same effect as him getting up and giving an impassioned appeal, walking back and forth, and you know, really sharing enthusiastically with people? It makes a difference. And so the idea of how you can best be prepared, it may or may not be memorizing. It may or may not involve using notes, and, and we're going to, in this class, the communications part of this, we're going to talk about how to do a better job with that. There's going to be a very practical aspect of this. Now, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to ask you all to deliver sermons. That will be the practicum that we do for people who are going to go into ministry. Then we will actually be doing and evaluating sermons. That's something I've, I've taught preaching, and we would evaluate sermons. Um, there. So we'll get into that later for those of you who feel that you're called into sort of a ministry kind of approach. Um, but how do you do it now to be more effective? We'll talk about that. Um, and then finally, delivery. Delivery is, is planning for how you're actually going to do this. The gestures, the pronunciation, the tone, the pace, your vocal characteristics, um, all of these things were considered part of uh, pronuntatio, which is what the Latin is for delivery. And so the, the Roman orators, they had guidelines for how you use your voice and gestures, um, proper, proper model, modulation and uh, tone of voice, phrasing, pace, emphasis of speech, the physical aspects like your stance, your gestures, your posture, your facial expressions. And they even develop practice exercises so that you could develop this for yourself. All of these things in service to the idea of how do you best instruct, persuade, communicate with a listener or listeners, but it also, rhetoric also applied to the written work. 
I think we have failed significantly in modern culture that we have lost the ability to do these things. Um, my undergraduate degree is in communications, and that is this communication theory. It's not media communications. And I've told many people, including we had great nephews who used to visit us in Seattle, and I said, whatever you study, whatever work you decide to do in your life, you also need to focus and study communications. And by that I mean the practical, both the theory behind it and the practical. Because you can have the best idea in the world, and if you can't present it in a way that anybody's going to listen to you, your bosses or your colleagues or, or, or your spouse, if you don't develop the ability to effectively communicate the ideas you have or demonstrate through the spoken word your, creative, your creativity, your whatever it is, then it's not going to help. You can be the most creative, you know, the most insightful, um, the most dedicated person in the world, and if you can't communicate that in a way that's going to cause people to pay attention to you, what good does it do? Unless you want to lock yourself in a lab and do all your own research and, you know, and, and not have anybody else involved in it. Does that make sense? So I believe that rhetoric, communications, is a critical part of what we all need as Christians. Whether you're planning to be involved in Christian leadership or ministry, you're still going to be talking to people about the faith. How do you do so in a way that it's not overwhelming, it's not, you know, you're not going to preach them into a corner, but how can you do so in a way that is compelling and persuasive and people are going to want to listen? Stan? Where's culture playing in all of this? Well, when we talk about, for instance, style, determining how best to present the argument or message, you have to be aware of what the culture is, okay? Um, in fact, the, the Romans identified under style that there was three styles. So it was high style, middle style, and low style. And much of that had to do with the culture, the cultural, uh, the nature of the cultural group you were speaking to. Is it formal? Is it every day? Is it simple? I use the example if you're speaking to a group of scientists or if you're speaking to uh, preschool kids. That's an aspect of culture. Now, um, if you're talking about the culture we're in and how does that affect, virtually every culture until the 20th century American culture understood that these principles were applicable to their particular <coughs> environment, their culture. We can use these principles, whatever culture we're in, uh, I think. So, to, uh, I'm, I'm thinking more of ethnicity. Of what? Ethnicity. Okay. When it comes to culture. So, we might be brought up in a different country, uh, uh, that type of thing. Like, right. would, would it uh, change somewhat on the delivery or the style uh, of the message to, say, a Hispanic group of people? or an African group, that type of thing, right. Eastern European. Absolutely. Yeah. But again, to a, these questions, or the, these topics and the questions are to be answered within that culture. You know, when I talk about style and I say, well, what kind of language am I going to use? Mm -hmm. Well, the culture of, of the group I'm talking, speaking to, whether I'm a part of that culture or not, that makes a difference in what style I approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and, and in, in fact, all of these, invention. You know, why do I need to say it? There may be different cultural needs that I have to reflect in what, my message and what I'm saying to. Arrangement, how I structure it may be varied by the culture, etc. So very much true. I will not use the same kind of language um, if I'm speaking to a, a, a cultural group, maybe a lower economic uh, group, that I would if I'm speaking to, you know, the the Daughters of the American Revolution, who are all you know really wealthy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's really a, that's a cultural difference as well. But any time, no matter what kind of cultural difference you're talking about, if you ask these questions in the context of that culture, you still will get the right answers. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. The answers will be different, but you will need to address that. But um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a very practical example. When I'm you know when I'm planning for all of this, one aspect of a presentation and. and Guillermo, I think you'll agree with me, because I know I know what you go through, and I don't know what Arturo went through. If I go, come heck or high water, I am going to start delivering this ser this sermon on exact at exactly this time to a Spanish language congregation, then I'm not taking into account their cultural differences because they are much more relaxed about time than we are. Arturo, you know, most of you all don't know Arturo. Arturo uh, was Arturo and Victoria. Really started our Spanish language ministry. Arturo died from cancer. Guillermo is now our, our senior, uh, our pastor of Spanish language ministries. But Arturo used to say to me, "These darn Mexicans! 
They never show up on time. Well, our girl was Mexican. He said, he said, we start the service at noon and they show up at 12.30. And I said, well, what if you started the service at 12.30? And he said, they'd show up at one o'clock. <laughs> now, that's not a criticism. It's just a recognition that they have a different cultural approach to that. Is that accurate? Am I being, yes, am I being exactly. fair? Now, and that's part of it. When I'm planning for my, you know, for, and, and it's also true that in many cultures, if I got up and I talked for 20 or 25 minutes, and then I sat down, they'd go, what was that? I mean, I, I had, when I was in seminary, there was a woman from uh, South Korea. And when we would have, we would have meetings and, you know, Bible study, devotional meetings, whatever, and we'd go an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes, and we'd stop, and she goes, where's everybody going? She said, in my culture, when we get together to study the Bible, we study for six or seven hours at least. And there was a cultural problem with that, okay? If I, if I preached a sermon that was an hour long in our service, you can't imagine the grief I would get. I don't care how good it is. You know, we have a couple people in our congregation, you know, one of them who's now with the Lord, and I'm sure smiling as I say these things. If I went, you know, five minutes over, I'd hear about it. Just five minutes over. And my response was always, but did you hear what I had to say? <laughs> you know, is maybe that more important than being five minutes over? Um, and yet, so there are cultural differences, and that has a lot to do with how we structure and plan for and prepare, and even, you know, the content of the messages. Um, I have very much, very much a more cognitive kind of presentation to our English language congregation than is probably appropriate to our, to our Spanish language congregation. And again, that's not a value judgment, it's simply a practical reality. Is that not true? Okay. Um, I, better, I better get into their gut a little bit more with the Spanish language congregation because that's more where they live. Uh, the English language congregation, they are more heady about stuff, and I better know that. So there are those cultural differences. Okay? Any questions about that? Well, let me give you one more thing, and this is from Aristotle. Um, the three types of rhetoric proof. Whenever we present, proof in this regard means the things that give us credibility. All right? What is it? And being aware of this, if we're aware of it, then we can be more concerned that we're being, uh, that, that we're using these things to the advantage of having people receive our message well. And it, it sounds like the three musketeers, but I'm, I'm going I'm to give you these three, ethos, pathos, and logos. <laughs> See why I said it sounds like three musketeers. Ethos is how the character and the credibility of a speaker can influence an audience to consider him or her to be believable. And that can include... Do you appear, and this has to do with appearances now, do you appear intelligent, or you, do you appear moral, presentable, of good reputation, trustworthy? If I showed up, and I stank, and my clothes, and I'm the preacher, and my clothes are torn and dirty, you know, like I just got out of the garden, um, and the first words out of my mouth are curse words, are people going to listen to me in the kind of congregation we have? That's the ethos. Do I present myself as someone who would be believable based upon what they perceive of me? Particularly if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm preaching a series of sermons on why we believe, and that gets into some of the philosophical and intellectual justifications of the Christian faith. If, no, if people look at him and go, he doesn't seem very bright, are they going to believe sermons on those kind of topics from me? Right? So we're just talking real practical down and dirty here now. How we are perceived, the ethos of our presentation, will make a difference on people's willingness to accept us and, and our message. Secondly, the pathos. Pathos is the use of emotional, uh oh, what's that all about? <laughs> Shut it down. Uh -oh. I have to let it do that and then we'll come back. I hate that. When the computers think they're smarter than you are and they do what they want, it just drives me crazy. Um, okay, let me see what I can do. If I needed help, I wouldn't ask you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. it does my heart good that somebody else talks to the computer. <laughs> so the second, um, uh, 
Sorry, I'll be jumping up down for a minute. After ethos, that is how we're perceived in the presentation, we have pathos. Pathos, and you'll see these again in a minute, pathos is the use of emotional appeals to alter an audience's judgment. Now, we all do this, when we, and, and that's through metaphors, storytelling, uh, quotes, presenting the topic in a way that evokes strong emotions in your audience. If you've ever had any sort of public speaking instruction, they will tell you, tell a story, give an example, give them a metaphor. Well, this is just like if. Those are the ethos, those, or the pathos, excuse me. Those are the things that create sort of an emotional buy-in in the people, especially a moving story. Um, and the third, the third is the logos. Logos is the use of reasoning to construct an argument, which is either inductive or deductive reasoning, if you understand the difference. By the way, almost everybody gets those two wrong. Induction, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. For instance, everybody thinks that Sherlock Holmes was a deductive, you know, that he deduced things. No, he induced things. Deductive reasoning is reasoning that is absolutely, unequivocally true. And particularly in logic, for instance, the, the logical argument, um, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's a deductive argument, meaning it's beyond question. An inductive argument is one in which the evidence supports your argument, but it's not absolutely true. For instance, we could uh, an, an inductive argument would be to say, or a deductive argument, um, sorry, inductive argument, would be to say um, every biological form we've ever known requires water. Therefore, every biological form we may discover in the future probably will require water. That's a reasonable argument based upon all experience, but it's not an absolute fact like a deductive argument. Almost all police work is not deduction, it's induction. It's, take, it's finding evidence that seems to give um, a conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt. Induction means beyond a reasonable doubt. Deduction means you can't argue that it, it's absolute, you know, unless you defy logic. All right? So anyway. Ethos. Making yourself believable by presentation. Pathos. Using emotional appeals or other vehicles, techniques, to get people to accept your uh, argument in logos, the use of reason, of mental acuity to construct an argument. Those are the three ways in which you prove that people should listen to you. <sighs> okay, so in case you need it, be able to actually read it, not just hear me say it, here are ethos, pathos, and logos, uh, the definitions. Let's go now, um, I want to turn to I mentioned earlier, my bachelor's degree is in communication theory. And so I want, which also, like rhetoric, I think is a very important to have basic understandings of communication theory. It's important for us to know how communication happens. Um, so communication, let's define the process of communication. It is the purposeful activity of exchanging information and meaning across space and time by various means. Now we're primarily here talking about interpersonal communications. Um, Purposeful activity, meaning it's intentional, that's the people part of it. Somebody makes a decision to communicate. There is certain kinds of communication that may happen apart from any intentionality. But we're talking about uh, purposeful activity, exchanging information and meaning, because the whole meaning, information and meaning are not the same things, across space and time by various means. So that's, I think, a good definition of communication. A definition of communication theory is the formal study of the technical process of human communications, including composing, sending, receiving, and interpreting information and meaning. Now, hopefully you will understand the relationship between those words and some of the things we just talked about in rhetoric. The composing, remember invention, deciding what your message is going to be, and then, and then deciding how you're going to present it. Sending is the delivery, um, receiving and interpreting is what you expect the other people to do, but you need to have planned for that so that your style is appropriate to the people you're talking to, etc. Now, I want to give you some, some words within communication theory, because again, I think these are valuable, because it leads us to ask questions that will make us better communicators. 
First, the source. The source is the information source that creates a message. For us, frequently, in Christian circles, the source is the Bible. I look at a text and determine what, you know, that this is my source. This is the information that I want to communicate. That's the first thing. Then there is the sender or transmitter or speaker. Speaker is actually the orator, is the word Aristotle used on this. The one who initiates, um, initiates the, <laughs> the message, cut out a word there, sorry, initiates the message and encodes the signal transmission to another. In other words, I decide this is the message and I put it all together and I send it. Whatever means I'm using. If it's email, if it's uh, you know, a letter, if it's a telephone call, if it's a sermon, if it's a lesson taught. The message is the content being communicated. What is the actual stuff that goes from me, the sender, to you, the receiver, by whatever medium? No, what is the content that is perceived? What is the channel, the medium used to transmit the signal? Is it the spoken word, the written word? Is it electronic? Is it you know, smoke signals? Is it um, American Sign Language? What is the channel? The receiver is the one receiving and decoding the signal transmission. It might be an individual if I'm having a conversation with you or I'm writing you an email. It might be a congregation. If I'm preaching a sermon, it might be a class if I'm teaching a lesson. They are the receiver or receivers. And then there's the concept of interference. Interference is anything that prevents transmission of the message and or the correlation between the intended message and the received message. Now, communication theory tells you there is always some kind of interference. There is no such thing as perfect communication. The ideal of this, I mean the perfect example of this, is if I were to stand before the Spanish language congregation and preach them a sermon in English, here, well, how many of the people in the Spanish language congregation would understand me if I preached them in English? Maybe 10%. 10%? That constitutes interference. If I am not speaking in a language they can understand, obviously I have a problem with the, the message being received and there being a correlation between the message I thought I was sending and the message that they got. All they're going to hear is... You know, if they speak no English at all, is Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Okay? You know Charlie Brown's teacher. You know Tom Yeah, sure. I've been deprived. In, all of, in, in the various TV versions they've done of uh, Charlie Brown Christmas and whatever, whenever Charlie Brown's teacher is there, when she's talking, all you hear is wah, 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 wah. So yada, yada, or whatever. So the, and, and there's various other kinds of interference. If I... If I am doing this every third or fourth word, what are they going to hear? Right. That's an interference. Or the, I, the computer. Or the computer screws up, yeah. Um, earlier when I said that if I showed up and, you know, I smelled bad and I was wearing filthy clothes that were torn and dirty, etc., nobody's going to want to listen to me. They're not going to hear what I have to say. That's a kind of interference. Loud noises right outside the window is an obvious kind of interference. There are a lot of different ways in which the signal can be interfered with. But the reason I give you this is if I understand there is a source and I need to you know, decide what that source is, I need to initiate and encode the signal, and in doing so I need to take into account the group I'm talking to, if I'm speaking to the Spanish language congregation, it better be in Spanish. You know, if I'm speaking to a preschool class, I cannot speak to them in the same language I would to a graduate level class. I actually made that mistake once. I was talking to a, a like elementary school, like low elementary, first and second grade class. I was asked to go in and do a little lesson. And I tried to explain to them the difference in sin with a big S and sins with a small S. Sin with a capital S being our you know, our, the broken relationship between us and God. The fact that we, you know, we are, we betrayed God. We are in rebellion against God. Small sins would be the things we then do that are wrong to reflect. And I tried to explain that to first graders. <laughs> I've gotten better since then. That was a long, long time ago. So the, the idea is all of these pieces, you know, who are the receivers? What is, the, what is the best medium for me to communicate this? All right? Some media, certain media are better in certain cases than in others. Um, and it makes a difference. I can remember one time, I, I, 
when I was in seminary, we had a preaching, we called it Preaching 3, big fancy title, and what it was is that we, we taught first year preaching students, and we then, for our benefit, we would meet with various preachers who really were good, and when I say good, I mean like Lloyd Ogilvie, who was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, and the, the senior pastor at Hollywood Press, and various other people from around Southern California, and there's a whole lot of really good preachers in Southern California. So we would meet with them and ask them for their, you know, their guidance and ask them questions and they would give us direction about how they did it. But I remember one time one of these preachers who will, make Renee, who will remain uh, unnamed, he said that the, the broadcast ministry, and he had both a radio and a television program, was really critically important to him because it gave him the ability to have a relationship with hundreds of thousands of people. And I heard him say that, and I thought, no, actually, it doesn't. It allows you to send a message to hundreds and thousands of people. It does not allow you to have a relationship. Well, the reason I give you that example is because there are some aspects of ministry and communication that do require feedback in order for them to be, you know, question and answer. It's kind of hard to have a question and answer part of your communication process if those people are on the other side of a TV screen thousand miles away, all right? So medium, the channel, can make a big difference. Recognizing the potential interference, the language I speak in, the environment that I decide that I'm going to do this in, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Understanding that all of these are aspects of effective communication will help us make good decisions about how we best communicate. Make sense? Any questions about that? I won't get into all of the really in-depth communication theory stuff with you. Some of the books that I read there, they actually take communication theory and break it down into mathematical models and diagram and all that kind of stuff. Trust me. Um, okay. Now, let's talk about preaching a little bit. Homiletics is the application of the general principles of rhetoric, and this isn't my definition, by the way, so I'm not the only one to think about rhetoric in this case, to the specific department of public preaching. Preaching is the proclamation of God's word, whether it be to believers or non-believers or both. So homiletics is the application, and it's the art and science of, you might say, uh, the application of principles of rhetoric to the specific department of, uh, department of public preaching. In other words, all of the things we talked about, you know, determining your message, um, determining how best to organize your message, determining what style you should use, determining what you need to do to be rightly prepared, memorize or whatever, and then actually doing it effectively for the purpose of instructing or persuading. If you do that with a Christian message, it's called homiletics. Right? Now, there are homiletics in some cases, rarely, but in some cases is used to refer to something other than religious discourse, but primarily it's religious discourse, and in our, in our culture it's primarily Christian religious discourse. You can't have a Muslim homily, and by the way, the word homily, um, from which we get homiletics, of course, originally was a meditation on a passage of scripture. In a lot of the high churches, Catholic churches and a lot of Anglican churches, it is still the tradition that what happens is that the priest, rector, vicar, whoever, whoever's assigned that day, will get up and whatever the reading for the day was, usually the gospel reading, but it can be, you know, we use the lectionary in our church. Every Sunday we have a, a gospel reading, an Old Testament reading, a New Testament epistle, um, and we use a psalm for the uh, responsive reading. Well, we use the same basic, the same lectionary that churches all over the world use because there's a revised standard lectionary. Well, a homily is historically meant to be a reflection or meditation on that scripture of the day. And it's usually only 10 to 15 minutes. Whereas sermons, as we Presbyterians and other Protestants usually uh, do them, can be based on any scripture that we feel is appropriate given what we think people need to hear, right? or what God has called us to give. But homily, homiletics, same word. Another way you can think about it is the composition and delivery of a sermon or other religious discourse. Other religious discourse, this would include lessons, 
in classes. Homiletics covers teaching as well as preaching. It's not limited. That's why this class is called Communications and Homiletics, but it's not just for preachers. Now, let me talk for a second again about the difference in teaching, preaching and teaching. I mentioned this earlier. And this is my own perception. Most Protestant ministers today either don't get this or they don't agree with it. Because most of the sermons that I hear preached, you know, if you go, if you go online or any of the websites or whatever and you see this, most of what's being done these days is not, to my mind, preaching so much as it is teaching. And there's not a hard rule between these, but I think it's helpful to us to understand that there may be a difference between what you should do in the pulpit and what you should do in the classroom. And I think, I think people can generally see a difference in what I do. Now, the series of sermons I'm doing right now, I have openly said twice in this series, this series of sermons is more the teaching vein than it is the preaching vein, but I'm doing it because I think that, that we need to hear this. We need to learn this stuff. Preaching, I define as the act of delivering religious truth or giving religious or moral instruction or exhortation for the purpose of touching people's hearts and changing lives. To me, that's the preaching act. You're not just trying to convey information, although that may be part of it. You're trying to change their life, touch their heart, make them different people because of something that they have heard as the Holy Spirit empowers them to, to be something different. Okay? Whereas teaching, to me, is the act of providing instruction or direction for the purpose of increasing people's knowledge. Now, it could very well be that by increasing their knowledge, they end up having their lives changed. But the difference is, teaching to me is primarily a cognitive act. You're dealing with their minds. Preaching is primarily a cardiological act. You're speaking to their hearts. I just made that cardiological thing up, but you get the idea. I don't know the good, good expression for that. All right? Cognitive and Emotional? Emotional, spiritual, spiritual. maybe spiritual mm -hmm. rather than cognitive. I like radiological. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about that? Marvin? It's just that yeah, we, can, we can be filled with all kinds of wonderful moments and never act on it. You know, uh, yeah. it's good to know, but yeah. do it. Right. And you know, some of the smartest, most fact filled people in the whole world are horrible, unfortunate pagans because their, their heart has not been touched by the truth of the gospel. They have not heard the word preached, even if they've heard it taught. And they have not been changed. They have not been made new creatures, as scripture tells us we are. And so the preaching act is to, is to bring people to the point that they recognize their need for Jesus, accept it, or if they're already believers, to grow in it, to grow in their relationships, so that they become new creatures, different than what they were before. Teaching is to provide content and information that will be helpful and useful and interesting. You know, heaven knows, I'm not, I'm not criticizing teaching, but it is a different thing. And there are sometimes that preaching is necessary, and there are sometimes that teaching is necessary. And I think that, that people who are supposed to be preaching and just teach miss it, and people who are supposed to be teaching and instead start preaching frequently will scare people off. There's a difference. Or, and, and maybe we need to understand that God gave the increase. We, we plant, we water, we teach, we preach, but without God's Holy Spirit, it, it's just noise. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, some people would say that you cannot teach <coughs> preaching, that it is a call from God, and that, I mentioned this at the break, um, that God calls people and he equips people to preach. That is, you know, the, the gift of the evangelist, it's a, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is given gifts of the Holy Spirit, one or more. And that some are given the gift of evangelism. We mentioned Billy Graham, who is not a very good preacher on any technical merit, but still, God clearly has given him the gift of evangelism. Uh, otherwise, millions, literally millions and millions of people would not be believers. Um, some people say that the gift of prophecy, which is the declaration of God's Word to people, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't teach it. Well, the fact is, God does give gifts... To my mind, God does give gifts to every Christian, one or more. It can be the gift of prophecy, or of evangelism, or of teaching, or of hospitality, or the gift of service, or the gift of tongues, or the gift of interpretation, or any of the gifts that are listed in the New Testament. But no matter what the gift is, we can either use that gift or not. God doesn't make us. And we can either... Study to make ourselves approved. In other words, we can either be work 
do our part to be good at using that gift. But God gives us permission. God doesn't force us to do anything. God gives us permission to, to mess it up. You know, if I, um, if I don't do my homework before I preach, then I don't care if I have the gift of preaching, you know, the proclamation of the word, the gift of prophecy, speaking the word of God, or not. If I don't do my part, God will let me fall on my face. So even though it is a call, and some people are miraculously gifted at this, let's face it, there are always exceptions. There are some people that God calls and gives them the ability on the spur of a moment to stand up with no preparation at all and do extraordinary things. I can't do that. I have to work at this. But that doesn't mean I don't think that God hasn't called me to it or that he hasn't gifted me for it. Okay? And so we have that choice. I believe people, they may not be able, we can't teach them to be a preacher, but we can teach them to be a better preacher. We may not be able to teach them to be a teacher, but we can certainly teach them to be a better teacher. And all of the techniques of rhetoric and communication, all the understanding of communication theory and all the rest of that that we're going to be dealing with over the next eight weeks, that will not make up for someone not having the gift of the, of the Holy Spirit in that particular area, but it will make them better at applying it and using it. Is that fair? Anybody want to argue with me? You can. <laughs> I know I'm hard to argue with, but that's so darn adamant about these things. What is the difference between preaching and evangelism? Well, evangelism is a special kind of preaching. Evangelism is still preaching, but uh, evangelism is specifically preaching to people who are not Christians to encourage them to accept the truth of Jesus Christ. Okay, And preaching is, is bigger than that. Preaching involves both evangelism and a discipling, you know, meaning to pre you, can, you can preach to people who are already Christian believers. You can't evangelize people who are already Christian believers. Okay, So it's a subset. Okay. Fair? Any other questions? <coughs> okay, I want to do something now. I'm going to shift over to sort of the pragmatic uh, application side of this by giving you, I told you earlier, I, was going to, I warned you I was going to do this, and you didn't escape, so. Um, some, I just sat down and, and wrote down some of the basic principles that I feel I've learned, I've discovered, God has taught me, whatever, over the years about preaching and teaching as general principles. Um, and, and these are important for me to have realized and written down, you know, because I, I've, at various times I've written these things and stuck them up on my computer monitor or whatever. But here's some things that I think will make you better at this process. And again, when we go along, we're going to be talking about a specific process for dealing with, with improving your ability to create, organize, plan for, create a right style for, prepare to deliver and deliver sermons and lessons. That's what this class is about. So let me give you just some, some of my ex notes of experience. How to do better at this preaching teaching thing, or what I call tips from Ross. And the first one is one of the most important ones, and one of the ones that gets is so, is so often not followed. A bored teacher or preacher is a boring preacher or teacher. If you can't do it with interest and energy, then perhaps you shouldn't be doing it. I might go so far as to say, if you can't present the gospel or a lesson from scripture in a way that has energy and that you're interested in, then maybe you don't have that gift. Maybe you're not called to that. I, when I was in seminary, my first year as a, in a, as a preaching student, <coughs> before I you know, uh, ended up teaching others, we had two aspects of our preaching class. One of them is we would give sermons. We would, you know, they we were taught about outlining sermons and all that in other classes, and then we would give a sermon and have it critiqued. And my my homiletics professor, Ian Pitt Watson, is the greatest preacher I have ever heard. And I count everybody. I count TV preachers. I count Dr. King. I count Billy Graham. I count everybody. Ian Pitt Watson was the greatest preacher I ever heard. And so he is the one that taught me the process of preaching and the one that would evaluate our sermons. But then there was another man um, whose name was John Holland. John was an actor. When he, I'm sure he's going to be with the Lord now because when I knew him, he was in his 80s. And he, while Ian would, would, would critique us on everything, including structure and, you know, and, and presentation and all that, John was a communications expert. 
I mean, his skill was in how to present well. In fact, I mentioned Lloyd Ogilvie. John was a close friend of Lloyd Ogilvie's and went to his church, and every Sunday after the sermon, the first sermon, because he preached like five times on Sundays, um, Lloyd would meet with John, and John would critique his presentation. And Lloyd Ogilvy memorized every sermon. In fact, funny story. Um, sorry to go off on these rabbit trails, but Lloyd Ogilvy had no notes with him. He would memorize his sermons. One day, he, and he said, stand in the middle of the platform in his full reform robes and everything else, and he preached. Well, he got out there one day, and he said, and after all, as we all know, when things get tough, the tough get and you can see his mind going back over those words. When things get tough, the tough get, and he almost said, the tough get things. <laughs> so, which is the danger of memorizing. But instead he said, and after all, as we all know, when things get tough, the tough get going. <laughs> okay, so there is some danger of memorizing. <clears throat> but John Holland would critique... Uh, Lloyd Ogilvie's sermons, and so he did the same for us. He taught us the communication side of it. And he also preached a lot of sermons along the way. And he said, I remember the day that he said to us, you know, the, the majority of preachers in America commit the only unpardonable sin week after week after week. The only unpardonable sin for a preacher is to be boring. <laughs> and he said, the only reason I can imagine a preacher of the gospel could be boring is if he or she doesn't really believe it's true. Because if you believe that the God of the whole universe decided to come to earth as a baby to grow up and minister and die for our sins and come back from the dead and rise up to heaven in the view of thousands of witnesses to come again in the future, if you think that's boring... I don't know what to do with you. Okay? And it's absolutely true. A boring preacher or teacher, 99 times out of 100, it's because they're bored. And how can you be bored if you really believe this is true? If you know the story and you believe the story is true. We have to have energy for this stuff. We have to get excited about it. People who tell me that they really enjoy my classes and stuff, the vast, vast majority of the time, if they tell me they like my teaching and they like my preaching, they'll say, and you're just so into it. You just seem to enjoy this stuff so much, which is true. I find this stuff, even if something I've pre preached or taught many times before, I still find it interesting. You know, I find everything interesting, almost. <laughs> But we have, to, we have to focus on this stuff and pray about it and think about it and work on it until we realize how exciting this stuff is. And then you'll get it across. Fair? Yeah. So, that's the first thing. This is in no particular order, by the way. I said this earlier. Preaching and teaching scripture is a calling from God, but you decide whether you will fulfill that call well or poorly. God can call you to preach, and you can do no work at it, and you can just mess it up. We do have to understand that God, God calls us, God inspires us, the Holy Spirit gives us understanding, and we sometimes confuse what part we play and what part the, the Holy Spirit plays. The, the story joke about the preacher who was headed to church on Sunday morning, and he put his notes up on the car while he was unlocking the door, and a wind came along and blew his notes everywhere. Just, they were, they were gone. It's before you can just go in and print out another copy, I guess. He gets to church, and he gets up in the pulpit, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say, I'm very sorry, but uh, the wind blew away all my notes this morning, and so I will simply have to preach by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and hope to do better next week. <laughs> um, I, and I'm going to get to this later. The Holy Spirit, and this is one of the things that Ian Pitt Watson taught, People who think that they get in the pulpit and then seek for the Holy Spirit to inspire them fail to realize that the Holy Spirit can just as easily, perhaps better, inspire them in their studies during the week so that they are, they are inspired and prepared before they get in the pulpit. That doesn't mean that God will not from time to time give you something new to say. You know, in fact, I learned a long time ago, and Carolyn knows this, when I was teaching, and I taught for 18 years at, like, at University Presbyterian Church, um, when I first started doing that, I would try to prepare everything. I would try to think of every example, every illustration. I would try to get all this stuff down, and it was flat. 
I finally realized the way God made me or the way God inspires me or the way God gives me messages is I prepare the, all of the content for the message, but most of the color, the examples, the metaphors, the jokes, the stories, etc., they come to me when I'm doing it. I did not plan on doing that story, that little joke I just told you about the preacher being inspired, you know, and doing better next week. Yeah. That's still true. Most of the color, most of the flavor comes at the time. Now, that doesn't mean I don't work hard to prepare, but I recognize that that's the way it works. It is not that God can't give you extra things to say, inspire you with, with an um, uh, illustration, story, whatever, but you better have your homework done before you start this teaching or preaching. Okay? Um, don't ever get into a pulpit unless you think you have something to say that the people need, and this is true in a classroom too, and that God wants them to hear. On that day, at that time, you are not like everybody else. I say that because when I was teaching preaching, it's like every, I did it for several terms, every term there would be some student who would get up there, first, first sermon they ever preached, and they would start out their sermon by saying, well, you know, I don't have any special insights into this, and I'm no better than you all, and I don't, you know, it's not that I have a greater understanding than you, it's not that I have any, anything that you all don't have, we're all equal in this stuff, but let me offer you this sermon anyway. As soon as they finished their sermon and sat down, I ripped them up one side and down the other. I said, how dare you stand in a pulpit and preach unless you think God has given you something to say that those people need to hear. If you don't think that you, you know anything that they don't know, if you haven't been inspired in any way that they're not inspired, then don't get up there. Because on that day, at that time, you are not like everybody else. You are the messenger of God. Not to get big-headed about that, but to recognize that if God is going to use you as his mouthpiece, don't apologize like you're no different than anybody else, because God doesn't use everybody for that. Fair? Okay. Next, don't, I already said this, don't wait to get in the pulpit to receive God's inspiration. He can and will inspire you earlier in the week if you'll get to work, if you'll do it. You're the preacher or teacher, so act like it. We don't just want to hear what somebody else thinks. Went to a Bible study once, a couple times in a church. And the teacher gets up and says, well, our lesson in our Bible study, uh, our, our Sunday school book this week, says this. And the teacher in the, in the book says that. And uh, they're, they're telling us that this. And, and I'm thinking, what do you think? You're the teacher. I can read that. I'm going to get to that reading in a minute. I can, I, I can read the stuff. What do you think? How do you tie it together? What conclusions do you draw from it? This relates back to the idea that, you know, we're, if we are God's servant, God's mouthpiece, in effect, for that, then we need to have something to say ourselves. And not just, now, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you using a quote. Last Sunday in my sermon, I read a fairly long passage from Mere Christianity which says it better than I could imagine me ever doing it. It doesn't mean we don't use quotes. It doesn't mean we don't refer to other sources. But if everything that comes out of your mouth, which was the case in this Sunday school, and it was taught, okay. Um, never mind. I, I started to say something, then I remember this is on tape. Um, or video, rather. Um, i got to be careful about that sometimes, naming names. Um, yeah, you can't just say, the materials say, the Sunday school book says, the, you know, the, my guide for election, you know, understanding the lectionary for the today says, you need to, you need to ask God, what is the message you want? And then you need to tell us what you think, because you are God's spokesperson right there. All right? <coughs> I'm not done. You don't have to know everything, and you shouldn't, so don't try to act as though you do. Um, you have to be willing to say, I don't know. You all have been in my, some of you have been in a lot of my classes. Have you heard me say, I don't know, sometimes, when I ask a question? Um, and there's several parts of this. One is we should not presume that we know everything. We shouldn't feel like we need to try to impress people by acting like we know everything. But even more than that, there is power in being able to say, I don't know. 
And there's power in that in every aspect of life. Carolyn and I have talked about this. She and I both have been in management positions in organizations. And we have seen, especially young people who are trying to you know, make a name for themselves, trying to make an impression, trying to move up in the organization, who are never able to admit that they don't know something or that they made a mistake. And the result of that is they always look insecure and they end up not being somebody that the boss wants to put more faith in. The fact is, if somebody asks you a question you go, and you said, I don't know, or if you make a mistake and you go, oh, man, I messed that up, that makes it clear that you're secure enough to be able to admit when you don't know something or that you made a mistake. And that security, that sense of security that you're expressing, elevates you in everybody's mind. And yet, that seems so counterintuitive, most people don't get it. But Carolyn and I have both experienced that. We've talked about that. To say, I made a mistake, or I don't know, without beating yourself up, or, you know, or whining about it, or trying to blame somebody else, or whatever, is the greatest sign that you're okay with yourself, and other people ought to trust you too. I mean that very seriously. Um, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a horrible example of that. You remember when, um, oh, Ollie North. Remember Ollie North? Mm -hmm. When Ollie North was in front of the Senate subcommittee investigating whether or not he had, he had participated in destroying documents to keep them out of the hands of the Senate. He came out of that, not smelling like a rose, being a hero, because they would say things like, is it true, Colonel North, that when our investigators were in the outer office, you were in the inner office shredding documents so that they wouldn't get them. You know what Ollie North said? He said, yeah, did I get them all? <laughs> and everyone laughed, and, and he came out of that as a hero. Whether he should have been or not is not something I'm addressing. But the fact is, he didn't try to say, oh, no, 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 no. He didn't make excuses. He didn't whatever. He stepped right into it. And in the process, everybody said, here's a guy who, who knows himself, who's comfortable with himself. Whether we agree with him or not, clearly he was doing what he thought was right, and he got away with everything. Now, that's a horrible example in terms of what it says, but the principle is the same. You will be far better received if you were willing to say, I don't know, and then find out, go find out, say, well, let me get back to you on that. Or if you say, I made a mistake. Then if you try to cover it up or pretend you know something you don't or whatever. Okay. Marvin. That's what I was going to say. Present, pretending to know something you, you don't know and getting yourself out there, I don't know, to dry. Yeah. That's what you know. yeah, exactly. Um, the next principle, you know far more than you think. When it comes to feeling secure about this stuff, and we're going to talk about, you know, uh, coming across with credibility because of, you know, you have to have some confidence in this. And one way to have confidence is to know you know far more than you think. When I graduated from high school, I had been very involved in high school in, in drama, in theater, and was a member of a theatrical society and all sorts of things. I assumed that when I got to college, this was going to be so far out, because I came from a small high school in East Tennessee, that college was going to be so far out of my league, I wouldn't know anything about how to do college productions. I wouldn't know anything about theater at that scale, you know, at that level. Well, the end of my, toward the end of my first year, I was in a class called Man in the Arts, which was a humanities, general humanities course all freshmen had to take. And I don't even remember the particulars, but they invited some senior theater majors to come and meet with us about things. And as we're talking about it, I can remember I said something about, you know, well, um, Jill Fresnel's will give you the kind of effect where they go, you know about Fresnel's, which is a kind of light theater line, you know, and Jill's, and, you know, and, and I said, yeah. And as we're talking, they started asking me questions, and I'm responding to this, and they said, you know more about theater presentation than almost anybody in our department. You've got to get involved, and I did. I ended up being involved in theater. My assumption was that I didn't know anything. And I found that I did. Now, I'm not bragging about that. It just happened to be that I had a really good, didn't even appreciate the fact that I had a really good theater teacher in high school. But we often go into situations thinking, I don't know anything. I don't have anything to offer. I don't, you know, I'm not. When in fact, it may very well be that you've got an enormous amount of very relevant knowledge to share. Don't 
start out by undercutting your confidence thinking you don't have something to offer. Okay? And that's true with scripture as well. I mean, even if you have nothing to offer other than this is what this mean, means to me. This is how this particular passage helped me. Let me share that with you. Most of the devotional books that are out there right now, that's all they are. You know, they're not eloquent. They're not scholarly. They are simply somebody sharing their heart about what God has said and done for them. Said to them and done for them. There's great power in that. That's wonderful. Um, no more than you say when you're presenting, or you'll go way too long, and you won't have anything with which to answer questions. The hardest part for me of preparing a sermon or even a lesson is usually cutting stuff out. How many times, Carol, in the last year have you heard me say, you know, she'll say to me on Saturday night, how's your sermon? And I'll say, well, I feel good about it, except it's twice as long as it, needs, as it can be. No. I've heard that 12 times. 12 times. <laughs> I don't know. But it's true. I mean, it's true. You've heard that a lot. Because I always end up, almost, with more that I can use. And so I have to end up cutting. What one, one writer used to refer to when you have to edit a document, cut things out, called it murdering the innocents. <laughs> you know, because you're having to cut out these words that you know you sweated blood to, to produce or whatever. Um, so don't tell them everything you know. You know, in in theater performing they they, they always say you always leave them wanting more, <laughs> right? I guess that's part of the principle. But it's also true that if you told them everything you know about a particular topic, even if they gave you that much time, more curiosity. Yeah, and, and they ask you a question, and you, uh, I'm sorry, but refer back to my talk, because I don't know anything more than that. That's it. Totally. Finished. Um, so, always be aware. Don't say anything you know. People can read. They don't need you to read to them. All right? If it was simply a matter of them having the words that you've composed, then we just, you know, photocopy and hand it out. There is, there is far more to the presentation of, of, of a message. Communication involves far more uh, than, <laughs> the presentation of a message than just the written word. So don't just read it to them. Or we just photocopy it and hand it out the back. Um, in fact, I recently saw that uh, studies now have demonstrated that people's evaluation of a speech or a public presentation, this is not sermons, it's a general presentation, was 7% the content communicated, and um, what was the middle part? Anyway, it was 58% physical presentation. 58%, more than half of what people evaluated as being a good or bad talk was how it was presented. Okay. Um, I think the middle, the middle part, whatever between 58 and 7 was, was the <clears throat> voice. But when they said the button, they mean, are you excited? Are you interested? Are you, you know, do you have hand gestures? Is your head held up? All of the pieces of the physical part of this, people are more moved by that than they are what you're saying. So when you stand up there and you do this and you just read it to them, what are you, what's that about? You're not giving them anything. You can't effectively communicate this kind of stuff if you don't ever look up doesn't mean you don't glance down. It doesn't mean you may not read a passage, you know, that's appropriate. But, you know, and, and if, if you're somebody that has struggled with these kind of things, we're going to work on this as we go along. But you don't just read to them. You won't become a better speaker, communicator, presenter, preacher, teacher, unless you do it. You have to practice this stuff. You have to do it. And you go, well, I don't get the opportunities to do it. Well, nobody invited me to teach these classes. <laughs> I just said, I'm going to teach classes. And I invited people, and what do you know? You showed up. You can find opportunities to practice the communication. You can announce that you're going to have a Bible study, and you're going to teach it. We need more people teaching Bible studies. And because you're going to take this class, and you're going to take the biblical interpretation class, and you're going to go back and watch the Bible classes, you're going to really, really be good at it. You have to do it if you're going to get better at it. Um, preach to or teach to whoever shows up. If it's 500, if it's 200, if it's 2. You do it. 
because that's who God sent. Um, when I was in college, the, the, the movie theater in our town, the Berea Cinema, you'd go there to watch a movie, and if less than like 10 people showed up, they'd come out, when it came time to start the movie, they'd come out and announce, we're not going to show the movie tonight because there's not enough people here. And we'd have to leave. Well, their reasoning, I guess, was pretty good because if they showed the movie, they had to pay a certain amount of commission. If they didn't show the movie, they didn't have to pay that. So they were saying, we're not making enough money here, so go away. Set. that, how do you think you feel when you send people away? We had a fellowship group at, um, in fact, at University Presbyterian Church when I, uh, I don't know if it's when I first started there, or when, I don't know if you were there yet or not. Anyway, um, there was a group that, we had all different age groups. Okay, and they, um, roughly speaking, like Genesis was the group, they had been young married couples in the Second World War, and they were still going, and so they were now people in their 80s. And then it sort of came down. We had a group that was for people in their 30s, 40s, whatever, primarily single, but some married couples. And I come to find out, we had a couple of people who were the, the greeters, and if somebody came to the door that they thought looked too old, they would turn them away. <laughs> Say, oh, this isn't for you. You want to go upstairs to the Sky Masters, which is what, you know, or Genesis, another group, or whatever. Um, I, I found out they were doing that, and the weird part is, one of the people, and she was a dear heart, she just misguided, one of the people that was doing that, the first time she met me, she told me this later, her reaction, because she was single, I was single at the time, her reaction was, he seems really nice. It's a shame he's so old. She was four years older than I was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, I got him. So she got him. <laughs> meant to be careful. And I'm only eight hours older than eight hours older than she is. So um, the idea is, if one person shows up, you teach. Well, when I do the the new members classes, you know, four hours of new members class. If one person shows up, I will do that class because that's who God sent. Right? Um, our church started with. When we came, with like 20 people. Um, we're do, getting consider, considerably more than that now, but I don't give it any more energy when I preach now than I did when we had 20. I don't feel any differently about it. So preach or teach to whoever God sends. Don't evaluate it based on, oh, there's not enough people here to really make it worthwhile. You don't know. If people fall, leave or fall asleep when you're speaking, bless you. Don't assume that you failed. Maybe they just remembered an appointment or needed the rest. <laughs> in fact, I regularly, because we have some, some older people in our congregation, older than what? Uh, older than me. Um, and some of them fall asleep. And invariably, you know, I'll get people on a fairly regular basis come up to me and say, oh, I'm really sorry I fell asleep. I have narcolepsy. Or I'm really sorry I fell asleep. I'm um, taking this medication now, and I can't sleep at night, so I fall asleep in the sermon. My, my reaction is always the same. I go, I don't, that's no problem at all. If you need it to nod off, that's fine. In fact, if I can help, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> don't get offended. Don't think you did something wrong. You may not have anything to do with it. Now, if everybody falls asleep, or half the people that you have to teach, then you may need to prayerfully revisit that. But don't, don't get offended or feel like a failure if somebody falls asleep or leaves. Okay. And finally, don't expect everyone to agree with you. Ultimately, it's not up to you. I get from time to time I will preach a sermon or teach a class and somebody will come back to me, usually later, because face to face, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be, but I know I'm kind of intimidating, people tell me. Uh, they'll come back to me later via email especially and they'll say, I really think you're wrong about blah, 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 blah. And I try to respond, you know, even, even handedly, and say, I understand, I appreciate that. And if they tell me why they disagree, I will try to respond to that. I don't get offended. I don't get mad. Not everyone is going to agree. And ultimately, it's not up to me to get everybody to agree with me. How insecure do you have to be to want everybody to like you and agree with everything you say? Jesus said, you know, you're in trouble if everybody likes you, if everybody approves of you. Because that means you're only saying what they want to hear. If you don't say things that challenge people ever, then you're not doing your job if you're a Christian teacher or preacher. Um, and it is not up to us to have somebody hear. The Holy Spirit is the one that says to them, this is true. This is right. This is good. You need to believe it. And if the Holy Spirit has not spoken to them in that regard, perhaps you will later.
I'm not going to get troubled by that. I also always, uh, I always also, if somebody says, I really disagree with you on, I ask myself the question, are they right? Not because I'm insecure, but because it's possible that I either missed something, I mistook something, I was mistaken about something, or I didn't communicate it well. And I'm open to that. Um, in fact, I go back and I watch these videotapes from time to time uh, for one reason or another, and it's kind of painful for me, but there have been a few of them that I've watched, and I said something that was just wrong. I used the wrong name, or I quoted a wrong date, or I made a wrong reference. I mean, I do that, and I go, oh, Ross, come on. But maybe when somebody disagrees with me, it's because I inadvertently said something wrong. And if I ever do that, by the way, I want you guys to tell me, stop me, you know. Just say, hey, I think you mean Paul, not Peter, or whatever, okay? So these are just some of my tips. I hope they're helpful. We're going to work on this, some of this stuff as we go along. And as I said earlier, I haven't by no means perfected this thing. I am not the epitome of how to do this stuff right, but I've been doing it for a while. And these are the things I've learned. And to the extent that I'm able to help, I want to. Any questions or comments about any of that? There they sat stunned for some moments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do have a question. All right. I have noticed that it seems to be sort of a following in sermons to put together where where you can listen to one person preach and another person, and it's it's a format that's being followed, and it's it's sort of like, well, I'll tell them a little of this, and I'll get them to laugh a little bit about myself or my wife or whatever. What? What is with that? <laughs> you mean multiple people doing one sermon? Uh, not the one sermon, but they, they have the format. one format. So okay. that, you know, it's like, it's a big thing now to knock down the wife, the preacher's wife, mm. in, for a lot of times. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than that. <laughs> She's only eight hours old. Now. <laughs> so you know, and, 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 and is there some kind of uh, service that are, are that they feel is successful, so they're following a pattern to do that? Well, in public speaking, you know, and I, I have a bunch of public speaking books too. There's a guy who works with TED Talks. Mm -hmm. you know, he's written like 12 books on this. Um, and he's won the world championship of public speaking and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll use some of the materials because some of it's really good. They will tell you that there are certain, you know, certain patterns you can follow, certain um, tools you can use, or um, and they'll talk about things like start with a, you know, start with something that sounds like a paradox. Or uh, one woman who won, who won the speaking, the uh, worldwide speaking competition, she started with, um, with a confession, she started out by saying, I have a confession to make. I think I have been teaching something that's not true for 10 years. Okay, now that's a mechanism where you confess something and you sort of look like going, what, what, what did you teach? You know, um, and, and I think she said, I'm afraid it's hurt people. And it had to do with stress and whether stress was always wrong or maybe stress could help you. Um, and so, yes, there are certain kind of mechanical um, things that people recommend using. I don't tend toward those myself. But it may be that a bunch of preachers have decided that this, that they, they do say that, that having something self-deprecating early on, you know, like, oh, you know, yesterday I thought I was being so smart when in fact I realized that I went out without my pants off or whatever. Um, you know, that something maybe I don't like the idea of being you know deprecating to your spouse or anybody else, but maybe that. Well, an another thing I've seen something like that is there there are um, skits involved, and that happened yeah. twenty years ago or so, or or something to kind of break up a sermon so that there's multimedia entertainment going yeah. on. You just I guess to keep people awake because well, they didn't know your tip about it's okay if people fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> the last time I was at a professional basketball game, which was in Seattle, the thing that struck me most, because I hadn't been to a basketball game for 10, 15, 20 years before, they could not allow one minute to go by without something happening to entertain or distract the people in the stands. If there was a timeout, there was this balloon traveling over dropping gift certificates, or there was a, somebody running out there and using a little, with a little trampoline to do, you know, dunk shots. Every second, 
that they weren't actually playing basketball, they had something else going on. And I'm, I'm thinking, is it really true that people's attention span is so short they can't turn to the person next to them and have a conversation for two minutes until the rep blows the whistle again? Some people, I think, have the same attitude in church. That they either, that, that they have to entertain constantly, or that um, you can't preach more than ten minutes without having a clown show up. <laughs> or, you know, or... Uh, you need to make sure that, that uh, you've got a ring girl in the tiny bikini and, you know, and now for the uh, prayer of confession, you know, whatever it is. I think if we are doing it well, then, and we're communicating important stuff and we're doing it with humor and, and with good communication skills, I think preaching a 20 to 30 minute sermon, people can handle that. Doesn't it seem like the focus is all off? It's exactly. All, it's, on, it, it, it's not on God. It's, a, it's the entertainment. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. a tickling. Some, I, you know, I, re, I preach usually 25 to 30 minutes every Sunday. And some people would say, oh, you know, just in principle, that's too long. You know, 20 minute sermons now. Um, well, we're growing a lot. People are coming. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think that some people, a lot of that, we got to entertain them, you know, uh, we got to keep, got to be all sorts of things happening, got to have a skit, got to have a, you know, uh, uh, the next music, we, all of that stuff, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have misread why people have a short attention span. I think they have a short attention span because most of the stuff that they're, the messages they're receiving are not worth receiving and they're so bored of that. If you give them something that's worth something, they'll pay attention. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do it well, yeah. you know, so the content, but then also if you do it in such a way that, you know, again, if I'm up there doing this, I don't care what content <laughs> there is, they're not going to listen. You know, people are going to be headed for the door before the sermon's over. So yeah, there, there's a little bit of both. Right? But I think a lot of it is that we, there's so much garbage communicated out there that people, people don't have attention span for that. And we misunderstand and think the attention span isn't there when in fact the problem is the garbage. Yeah. And we need to give them better stuff and then they'll pay attention. Mm -hmm. Something to chew on. Yeah. 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 You always give us something to chew on. Yeah. Um, you know, and go home. And sometimes it. it's my leg. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I go home and I say, you know, I, I might really like to debate that across, but just let me think about that first. Good. Because I know you are knowledgeable and well equipped with the information you've given us, <coughs> given us everything. That's obvious, you know. Where I come with this much knowledge and, and I'm wondering about one thing that you have given us. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you give us something to chew on. Okay. Which is, I hope, a, a, a point for growth and development of the right. individuals who are there, which is your purpose. I hope so too. Although I'm still thinking about that ring girl thing. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate it. Have a good week.